All right, so our study in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ continues. We're still in Matthew 16, Mark 8, and Luke 9. We're still in Caesarea Philippi from a a location perspective where there's a series of revelations of the mysteries of God being revealed to us through the words of Jesus. And the mysteries of God are truths that are kept secret from before the foundation of the world but are now being revealed in time to his people. And these mysteries are transcending truths both in heaven and on earth. And three weeks ago, we looked at the first one, the mystery of Christ. Two weeks ago, we looked at the second one, the mystery of the church. Last week, we looked at the third one, the mystery of God's plan of redemption. And we saw, we read, Jesus himself said that he must go to Jerusalem, be rejected, suffer at the hands of the elders, be killed, and raise again on the third day. And Peter didn't care for that too much, and so he rebuked the Lord, and then the Lord stingingly rebuked Peter. Get behind me, because you favor not the things of God, but the things of men. And so in Peter's rebuke and the Lord's counter-rebuke, we learn that there is only one way for fallen man to be redeemed from death, and that is God's way. And the flip side of that coin is all of man's ways, therefore, are lies, not to be trusted. So this time as we move forward, we're going to be looking at the mystery of salvation. And we are in Matthew 16 to start. Verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples... If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If any, any Jew, any Gentile, any, whosoever will. If any, and in in the King James, man is in italics which means it's not in the original language. It's put there by the translators and they put it in italics that we would know that they did that. If any man, okay, does that mean uh, we're just talking to the males here? No, this is the word of God. According to the word of God, God's definition for the word man is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. Man, in the word of God, man is male and female. Okay? It's just every once in a while, we just have to cover that base. Uh, if any person, any man will come after, will. What does will mean? Choose to. We've been given a free will. We have a choice. We have a responsibility to exercise it. Uh, And that's contrary to a very popular doctrine in Christianity today. The marketplace version of Calvinism says man has no choice. The Word of God, as I read it, clearly says man has a choice. If any will come after me, come after to follow to accompany, to walk with, and in the context, walk behind, because it can only be one leader. And Jesus Christ, our good shepherd, is the leader. If any will come after me, let him do what? He, he, he just got done rebuking Peter. You, you, you don't favor the things of God, which are of the Spirit, but you favor the things of men, which are of the flesh. You don't want to follow me. You want me to follow you. No, get behind me. Get behind me. Follow me. And now he's going to tell them what it means to follow him. And it's three things. First, deny himself. To follow Jesus means to deny ourselves. To deny the denial of self means my will, my plans, my wants. My leadership. 
it does not mean self-denial. Denial of self is not self-denial. There are many people who practice self-denial. Professional athletes, celebrities, anyone who makes a living with the performance of their body practice self-denial. But the heart is unchanged. That's still a self-first and I'm leading kind of a thing. No, denial of self, not self-denial, denial of self is the humbling of one's will, setting aside, laying it down, one's will, one's plans, one's ways, in favor of embracing God's will and God's ways. If we turn backwards in the Gospel of Matthew to chapter 11... The last three verses, starting verse 28, Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Jesus saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Why are people laboring? Why are they heavy laden? They're doing it their way. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Here we have Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He came because the Father sent him. He laid aside his will to do the Father's will. And he is telling us to take on his yoke, that that harness that went over the necks of two oxen that they would do work, servants unto the master, a strong one who essentially was doing all the work, and a young one, a weak one who was learning how to do it. Take my yoke. He's the one doing all the work. We follow him. Uh, That's only possible by taking the yoke is to humble yourself, to have it put on, to deny self and to follow him. So, self-denial is still self-first. Denial of self is self-last. Self-denial is, I'm still leading. Denial of self is, I am following. Uh, And so what we have to have to deny ourselves, to follow Jesus, to deny ourselves, is we have to have a reorientation of self from self-first, which is our nature, (laughs) from self-first to self-last, which is the nature of Christ. Definitely not ours, but it is his. And and that reorientation, that, that, that mystery, if you will, is revealed here, But then after Jesus returns to the right hand of the Father and he sends the Holy Spirit to teach them, it's developed in the epistles. And so if we go to Romans chapter 12, for example. Romans chapter 12, starting verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren... By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. If I'm a sacrifice, whose will is being done? The Lord's. And if I'm in one accord with him, then it's also mine. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of of faith. If I think highly of myself, I'm in the flesh. And it's self first. 
But if, on the other hand, I think according to God, I think self last, which is the nature of Christ. And I receive and walk in that by faith. Uh, Same chapter, verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. It's it's not about us. It's about the Lord our God, and it's about all others. Jesus came, and he demonstrated that. Self-last. If we're to follow him, so must we. In Romans 15, another example. Again, starting verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that, that reproached thee fell on me. We're to serve the Lord. And we're to serve each other. We're not to serve ourselves. Self first serves self first and maybe even exclusively. Self last serves the Lord and serves others and doesn't have time to self serve. In Ephesians chapter 5. Again, starting in verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. He denied himself because he loved us. That's what love is. Love is sacrificial. Love is others-centered. Love is God-centered. Lust is self-centered. So we have to have a complete reorientation of self. Away from self first and to self last. Now, going back to Matthew 16 then, the second part of what it means to follow Jesus is to take up his cross. Cross? What's that? The Roman cross. Well known. Romans made sure everybody knew what a cross was because they executed criminals on main highways, intersections in particular, so everybody would see. So this is not a foreign concept to the disciples. They know exactly what this means. And the cross is a place of suffering and death for the flesh. The third thing is to follow him, to accompany him, to walk the same way. Walk on the same road with him. And he already told us what that was. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. That would be man's way. That would be self. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find that. That is God's way. So, Jesus says, if you're to, if you will, if you choose to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Where is he going? Where is he telling his disciples that he's going and to follow him. Well, in the immediate context, he's going to Jerusalem. And what's going to happen there? He's going to suffer. And he's going to be tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's going to be tried like he had not been tried before. And he will there have to say no to the flesh and yes to the Spirit. Follow me there is what he's saying to to them and to all of us. And of course, he is leading to eternal life. Salvation from death. Follow me. I am the way, 
the life and the truth. Only one way, God's way, it's me. Follow me. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Now, he, this is not the first time these, these 12 guys have heard this. The first time, well, we just flip backwards again in Matthew to chapter 10. Uh, when he's preparing them to go out two by two on the first mission trip without him, he, he broached this. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 38, he said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. So now, by the time we get to Caesarea Philippi, he says it again. And there's a little bit more context to it this time. Uh, God's way to salvation, which is the only way, means denying self. My will be done, not yours. Must be transformed to your will be done, not mine. Uh, It means the cross. Dying to self. And it means following Jesus into a right relationship with our creator and into eternal life. And that is what being worthy is. Being worthy of Jesus is trusting him with your eternal soul. And many people don't even believe that the soul is eternal. Well, you got to... We are created in the image of God. God is spirit. God is eternal. We have an eternal spirit. And so... Being worthy of Jesus is trusting our eternal soul with him. Obeying, doing what he says. Now, there can only be one Lord in a person's life. Jesus has taught, is teaching, and will teach again. That if self is the Lord, where do we go? destruction, eternal death. But if he's the Lord, where is he going? Eternal life. There can only be one Lord. Who's it going to be? That's the choice that every man must make. Back to Matthew 16 then. Verse 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So, save People say we're saved. Do you know what we're saved from? If we're saved, we're saved from something, right? What are we saved from? From death and the wrath of God. Two really good things to be saved from. And so, whosoever will, there we go, whosoever, any person, any one of Adam's race, whosoever will exercise their choice, uh, Whoever, whosoever will save his life, meaning to preserve it, maintain it, insist on their will, their way. I, it, it, what, that, what that means is if whoever refuses, verse 24, whoever refuses to deny themselves, to pick up their cross and to follow Jesus, insists on being the Lord of their life. And they insist on living life on their terms and not on God's terms. And they insist on their ability to save themselves from death and from the wrath of God. What happens to that person? Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, fail, shall find destruction and eternal death. But, and whosoever will, the other choice, lose his life, meaning, verse 24, deny self, pick up cross, follow Jesus, abandon my will and my plans and my ways, and embrace God's will and God's plans and God's ways, which must be by faith because he's infinite. I'm, I'm finite. I can get my head around all this stuff, but I can't get my head around all this stuff, so it must be by faith, and the just shall live by faith. Uh, If I will lose my life, then I shall find it. I shall preserve it. I shall shall secure it, and that eternally so. 
Eternity is what's in view. It's either eternal death or eternal life. And that's the choice that's put before every person. Now, this seemingly oxymoron in the world's eyes, whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Uh, This is the second of four times Jesus has taught this. The first time was also back there in Matthew chapter 10. It It would have been the next verse if we kept reading there when he's preparing to send his disciples two by two to go into uh, witness for him. This is the second time here at Caesarea Philippi. In about a year, he's going to do it again. And then in the final week in Jerusalem, he's going to say it again. Must be important. Uh, This is a a mystery. Who Who saves, loses, and whoever loses, saves. It's a mystery that's revealed to us in the epistles. So let's look at that in Romans chapter 8. A few words becomes more as the revelation of the Holy Spirit is recorded by the apostles. In Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And see, that goes back to the revelation of these mysteries. The key to understanding the mysteries is to understand Jesus is speaking of that dichotomy between flesh and spirit. And in Roman, excuse me, Galatians chapter 5, we're told that the two are contrary to one another, always. But there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, meaning my flesh was weak, there's no way my flesh can keep the law, God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness for those who believe. And if we're in Christ, then that righteousness is in us. He is our righteousness. It's fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded, to to think in the flesh, to act in the flesh, is death. But to be spiritually minded to think in the spirit, to think on the things of God and not man and not self is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they are in the flesh, cannot please God. Is there any misunderstanding of those words? Those who live according to the flesh cannot please please God, it doesn't matter how high their moral standard is because the nature is corrupted. The nature is flawed. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell on you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. If you save your life, you will lose it. If you lose your life, you shall find it. In Galatians chapter 2, how is it possible? Galatians chapter 2, starting verse 19. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 
And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. How is it we can lose our life and gain it? Because Jesus laid down his life and took it up again. And what was extended to us was grace. Only by the grace of God. When we deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him, we are recipients of the grace of God. Our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. We have the newness of life. If we insist on our own way, even a variation of the Christian gospel, then why did Jesus die? We're alive by grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, that's expanded a little bit further for us. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that not worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, our lifestyles, in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But... God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What is the gift of God? Grace and faith. Jesus is the author and the finisher of faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. We lived after the flesh, every last one of us. So first, my way, what I want, on the road to destruction. But God (laughs) revealed himself to us and by grace has saved us from eternal death and from the wrath of God. In Philippians chapter 2, This mystery of salvation. Again, starting in verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, humility, Let each esteem other better than themselves, self-last, instead of self-first. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. That's our mind, his mind, self-last, not self-first. Deny self, pick up the cross. He followed the Father. We follow him. In the next chapter, Philippians chapter 3, 
If you look at the end of verse 3, it says we have no confidence in the flesh. We will not trust our fallen sinful flesh to do anything that's pleasing to God. We have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Oh, you want to compare your resumes? Let's do it. Here's mine. How's yours? Doesn't matter. Verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. If you save your life, you will lose it. If you lose your life, you will save it. God's way. It's the only way. Now, going back to Matthew chapter 16. Verse 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If, a, if whoever wills save their life and lose it, verse 26, what good did it do you to reject God's way, his plan of salvation and his, his plan of redemption and his salvation? Uh, what did it profit you, even if you owned the whole world, if you lose your eternal soul? When you've come to your end of days and you take your last breath on earth, what good does all that stuff do you? How much would a man, must a man give in exchange for his soul? How many possessions must he give God to redeem his own soul? How much wealth, how much money must he give God to redeem his soul? from death and from the wrath of an offended God. Read Psalm 49. There is no amount. Can't. Only God can redeem the soul. Uh, Proverbs 10.2 says, Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. So the question that Jesus might be asking, that's what questions I hear, uh, what value do I put on my soul? How much stuff? How much money? If I choose to walk in the flesh and not in the spirit. Well, on the flip side of that, in the ways of God, in the ways of the spirit, how much does God, how much value does God place on my soul? The cross of his son. The blood of his lamb. No matter how much money I have, no matter how many possessions I end up with, it pales. It's not even a rounding error to the value that God has placed on my soul. Verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall reward every man according to his works. Uh, God's plan of redemption, the only way to be redeemed from death. He accomplished it. And now every person must choose whether to believe that or not. Whether to favor the, the things of God or the things of men. To reorient self from self first to self last or not. To save his life or to lose his life. 
will. It's a choice that every person must make. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to reward you according to your choice. One of the last words in the scripture, Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And the work is plainly, do you believe? Do you trust me? Have you committed your eternal soul to me? Which meant you denied yourself, you picked up your cross and followed me, or did you not? Bottom line. So clearly, this mystery of salvation, it is the work of God, but every person has a responsibility to make a choice, to believe it or not. Now, if you go with me to Mark chapter 8, the parallel passage, we get a little bit more information. Mark chapter 8. We're in verse 34 over here. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Is there any news? There is. He called the people unto him. Ah, you see, we have a bigger audience than 12 disciples. We have other people who were there at Caesarea Philippi, which was a very, very, very busy place. It was on the road to Damascus. All the shrines of all the false gods of all the nations were there. It was a busy place. And so not just to the 12, but to the people there, he said unto them, deny, take up, and follow. Verse 35. And whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. So again, another piece of information in verse 35. Not just for Jesus' sake, but also the gospels, his word, his word. To lose one's life to Jesus and to the gospel is to save it, preserve it, secure it for all eternity. And... Jesus gives everyone a choice because he's not just talking to the 12. He's talking to the 12 in a crowd of who knows how many. And no doubt, being the location, it's a mixed multitude. In fact, it might mostly be Gentile. We don't know. But everyone is given the choice, eternal life or eternal death. And both are seen and heard. Uh, Eternal life is seen, or I should say heard, by one's answer to the question in verse 29 in Mark's account, but whom say ye that I am? The choice between life and death hinges on that answer. The one to life says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The one to death says, oh, you're a good man. You're a good teacher. You're, you're a good rabbi. But no, you're not God. No, you're not the Christ. You're not the Messiah. You're none of those things. You're not the Lord of my life. But you're a good moral man. That's the way of death. And both of them are seen in how one lives their life according to how they answered the question. If he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and if you want to follow him, you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow That can be seen. That can be witnessed. To reject it, that can also be seen. I'm not going to deny myself. Are you kidding? I'm going to indulge myself. I'm going to help myself. It's all about me. That can be seen as clear as the nose on my face, which is pretty clear. Amen? (laughs) So the difference between eternal life and eternal death is Jesus Christ, and who do you say that he is? Verse 36. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, the world, 
values us one way. God values us another way. The world, to, to the world, our value is a function of what we have. Possessions, wealth, money, influence, power, usually can be quantified in a number. Our value in the world is a function of what we have. But God's value on us is who? It's is. It's our identity. We are in Christ. We are his children. To the world, it's what we have. To God, it's who we are. And so the, the mystery of salvation in those terms then means the choice to forfeit what I have to be who he is. Very straightforward. Very uncomplicated. Verse 38. Whoso therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. We cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Whoever... Jew, Gentile, any one of Adam's race. Whoever is ashamed of, meaning deny, to deny Jesus, uh, that he is not the Christ. He is not the son of the living God. He is not the Messiah. He is not God's servant. He was not rejected and executed on a Roman cross. He did not die. He was not buried. He did not raise again on the third day. This is all myths and feel good stuff and I don't believe the things that are in the Bible because those were just words of men that's being ashamed of Jesus and being ashamed of his words therefore denying them anyone who does that in this adulterous and sinful generation meaning in this world (laughs) as long as we have breath in our lungs as long as they do that when Jesus returns and he is returning he'll be ashamed of them He'll deny them on the day of judgment when he comes in glory, not as God's servant, but God's king and God's judge. Now, Jesus already told this, by the way, to the 12 when he was preparing them to go out two by two. If you confess me before men, I will confess you to my Father which is in heaven. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father which is in heaven. And now here at Caesarea Philippi, he's saying it to them again, as well as everybody else who's there, who could hear what he's saying. Finally, some other pieces in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. In verse 23, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What's the news? Daily. We pick up our cross. We deny ourselves. We pick up our cross once, one and done, daily. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31, the resurrection chapter, I die daily daily. Self must die daily. Verse 24. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory and in his fathers, and of the holy angels. What does the world, what advantage does the world offer to us for eternity? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What does Jesus offer us? Everything. So are we going to cling to the world or are we going to cling to Jesus and his words? If you have God's perspective, who is eternal because he inhabits eternity. It's a simple choice. It's a simple choice, but a choice nonetheless. Uh, Let's put a ribbon on it 
by going to Romans 13. It's mystery of salvation. Romans 13. This is what we covered on Wednesday night, the prayer and and study time, starting in verse 11. And that, knowing the time, and now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and in envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Self, in the, as it relates to the mystery of salvation, self must be reoriented away from self first to self last. And that contrast is captured in these verses. We're to lay down our will, self will, which is always self first. We're to lay down our finite and flawed ways because we are finite and we are flawed. Therefore, all of our ways are. We must lay down the flesh because there is no good thing in our flesh. And the carnal mind cannot please God. We must lay down our sin and our death. And we must take up the Lord's will. Self-last. We must take up his infinite and perfect ways because he is infinite and he is perfect. Therefore, all of his ways are infinite and perfect. We must take up the spirit, the new man, the newness of life that is in Christ Jesus must take up eternal life. That's the choice. That's the mystery of salvation. Now, there was a a missionary to the headhunters in Ecuador, a number of missionaries. Uh, In 1957, there was an event. But one of those missionaries was Jim Elliott. And he said this, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I can't keep the world. Even if I owned all of it, I can't keep it. But if I put it down and hold on to Jesus, I can't, can't lose it. So for how many days we live on earth, even if we live to be 120, in comparison to the absence of time, it's a blink uh, It's during that time, while we have breath, we have a decision to make, which is both heard and seen, professed and lived. Am I going to live in the ways of eternity, in the ways of God, or am I going to live according to the ways of the world and myself? That's our choice. That's our choice. So this mystery of salvation, it is the work of God. We don't do it. We can't lead ourselves there. It's the work of God. But we've been created in the image of God. And he has a spirit and he has a will. And we've been given the choice. We're responsible to choose. And we'll be rewarded according to our choice. So, if you're here this morning and you have not bent your knee and confessed with your tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord, Scripture says... Today is the day of salvation. To take hold of that which you can't lose. Amen? So if you'll stand with me, please. Father, truly your ways are so much higher than our ways. We thank you for the revelation of these things that you've given to us in the shadows of what we call the Old Testament, in the light of the world, who is Jesus, and then the instruction of those things in the Spirit through the epistles. All of your words, God-breathed, 
They are inspired. They are inerrant. They are infallible. And thank you, Lord, that they are written. This mystery of salvation, we cannot save ourselves. But we must choose if we trust you to save us or not. I pray for anyone who might be here, might be listening, who haven't made the choice to trust Jesus. May the Spirit work in them, encourage them, comfort them, convict them, witness to them that this is true forever. And may they, right now, deny themselves, humble themselves before you and take your cross. And from this moment forward, follow you. We love you, Lord. We need you desperately. And as we started our study by perhaps examining the days in which we live through your prophetic word, again, give us wisdom. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.